Okay, we'll be continuing today uh, with uh, covering uh, chapter three. And in particular, we'll be looking at the matched filter, a very important concept for the linear uh, sampling receiver. And this is covered in section 3.2.2 of the Sklar textbook. So we saw in the um, last time the form of the uh, matched filter, uh, excuse me, of the linear sampling receiver. And we saw that in there, the first element in the receiver is a filter. And we know that this filter is characterized either by its uh, um, impulse response or by its uh, frequency response. And we know that after the sampling, we have this test statistic. And the test statistic is given by this expression where there is a signal component, which uh, depends on which uh, symbol was being transmitted, and there's a component uh, from the additive noise. So the symbol, signal and the noise contribute equally to the statistics. And we pose the question, is there a choice of filter which gives me better performance, in particular, I want to favor the signal and diminish the noise. And that is really what this whole section is about, about matched filter. So we're trying to say we have, so far in our analysis, really have a free choice of this filter. And today we're going to discuss uh, what would be a good choice. And to do that, we're going to be focusing on this idea of the component that comes from the signal and the component that comes from the noise. So let's look at the signal first, and let's concentrate on the instantaneous power in that signal. Now, we're interested in the power at the time of sampling, because in the end, the statistic that we're using here to make our decision, it's only the input, uh, the received signal at the time of sampling. So at the time of sampling, the contribution from the um, uh, signal will be the signal transmitted convolved with the filter that we have chosen for our receiver. And then, of course, this convolution is a function of time. And then we're going to sample it at uh, the um, time instant, uh, capital T. And this will give the um, signal contribution. And one way that we can evaluate that convolution would be by using um, multiplication in the frequency domain. So here we have the frequency domain analysis. Um, and what we're interested in is the convolution. So to get the convolution back in the time domain, I do an inverse Fourier transform of the frequency domain representation of the output of the, of the filter. And of course, once I have the time domain version, I again do the sampling at time of t. So I can look at the signal contribution, and I want to really focus on the impact of the choice of filter. And it's a little easier for me to see what's going on in the frequency domain. So I have the choice of working in either domain, and in this particular case, uh, frequency will seem to be the best choice. So for instance, we have this evaluation, which is a function of frequency. And the only place that T appears in this inverse Fourier transform is here. So here's the function T. And of course, I'm going to evaluate that at capital T. So that was the amplitude that's coming out of the signal. And if we want to calculate the power, of course, the power is proportional to the amplitude squared. So we would take this inverse Fourier transform. We're going to leave the possibility of this being complex. And so I'm going to take the module squared in order to calculate what is the instantaneous power in the signal sample uh, at the receiver. So I have an expression here in the frequency domain. Uh, 
which I think is going to be a bit easier uh, for me to analyze. So this is what's going on on the signal. And now we have to look at what's going on uh, with the um, output of the noise. So let's think the noise is a random process and we know that it has a power spectral density. And if we have a linear time invariant system, a system with a frequency response of h of f, and we know that the input power spectral density is g of x, you recall that when we did a review of filtering, we saw that the power spectral density at the output is just the power spectral density at the input multiplied by the module squared of the filter frequency response. So now I can ask myself, what happens when this input is noise? What is the contribution at the output? And again, because of this relation with linear um, time invariant systems, it's easier to work in the frequency domain. So when I use noise, then I know that the uh, power spectral density of the noise is flat across all frequencies. So I have the power spectral density of N0 over 2, which means that the output is basically the shape of the filter that I've chosen, and it's being multiplied by this density of the noise. So now I have the uh, profile, the power spectral density, of the noise at the output of the filter within the uh, linear uh, sampling receiver. So uh, this is really just a, a recall of what we just said. Uh, we have the input power spectral density, we have the output power spectral density, and now we ask the question, what is the average power? And to find the average power, what I do is I integrate over the power spectral density. So this is the density over the frequency domain, all frequencies. And so now if I want to know the total power, it's going to be the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the density. So I put in the density and I integrated all of it. I'm coming to the, finding the area under the curve. And of course, I have what gy is, n0 of 2 is a constant, and go outside of the integration. And basically, what I'm looking at is the area under the square of the um, frequency response of my filter. So this is the average power of the noise. And now I can form a signal to noise ratio, because clearly h of f appears in both expressions for the instantaneous power of the signal and for the average noise power. So h of f uh, affects them both. And what I'd like to do is to diminish the noise and increase um, the signal. And so we call this uh, relationship, the signal to noise ratio, as being the quantity that I want to, um, so it's signal power over noise power. This is the signal to noise ratio, which you've heard about many, many times. And now I've just put into this expression, into this ratio, these two integrals that I'm using to examine the power, to calculate the power in the frequency domain. So here I have the inverse Fourier transform of the um, product of convolution. Uh, so I'm taking the inverse Fourier transform, and of course I've evaluated that at the sampling time. So what I'd like to do is to maximize this ratio. And fortunately, we have a mathematical relationship uh, that allows us to find what h of f choice will maximize this ratio. And what we're going to use in order to determine uh, the h of f that is optimal is to look at the Schwartz inequality. So the Schwartz inequality is given in blue here. And it relates any two functions, any two functions g1 of x and g2 of x, and they can be complex functions. And the integral squared, module squared, of the correlation of these two um, uh, signals, g1 and g2, is on the left hand of the inequality. And on the right hand of the quality, we have the product. We take 
um, the um, square integral, the L2 norm, basically. This is the L2 norm of G1 and the L2, uh, excuse me, L2 norm of G2. So if I take the product of these L2 norms, they're equal to uh, taking the product of G1 and G2, integrating it, and then taking the module squared. Of it. So Schwartz's inequality. And this is an inequality. And if I want to know when is this inequality actually equal, well, they're equal when one G is just a multiple of the other G's um, conjugate. So we said that they could be um, complex. So this here is the complex uh, conjugate. So if these G1s and G2s are so similar that they're basically multiples of one another, once I take the complex conjugate, then I'm actually going to get equality in this expression. So Schwartz's inequality. Now we're going to show how we can use Schwartz's inequality for our signal to noise ratio. So here's the SNR. Here's Schwartz's inequality. And now we have the two definitions of G1 and G2. It's true for any functions G1 and G2. And here we put in G1 the matched filter that we're looking for. And in G2, we put uh, these two terms that we find in the integral. It's the signal multiplied by the complex exponential. So now we'll just uh, step through it and we'll make the substitution. Uh, first of all, we have from the numerator, this is the equivalent to one side of the inequality. And then we're going to uh, look at the other L2 no norms and make the uh, relationship in between these. And to, with these two results, uh, we can now uh, use the, um, uh, I guess we should look at the L2 norm for the signal component. And we notice that the signal is multiplied by the complex exponential, but of course the complex exponential has a module which is equal to one. So that component does not change uh, this um, L2 norm, and so that we really have just the uh, L2 norm of the signal by itself. So now that we have these um, assignments of, of uh, roles to each one of our integrals, now we can just uh, put them into Schwartz's uh, inequality. So now we have this relationship directly from Schwartz's inequality, and from this we can form uh, something that looks like the signal to noise ratio. So we uh, come over here and we say that this signal to noise ratio, or something that's very close to the signal to noise ratio, is bounded from above by the signal power. So we here we have the signal power, and it provides an upper bound to what this relationship could be. And then what do we do? Well, we just um, multiply and divide by n0 over 2. And then uh, what we get is exactly what we're looking for in the signal-to-noise ratio. So we have this um, signal-to-noise ratio. And of course, if we want the signal-to-noise ratio to be as high as possible, what we'd like is for us to get equality in this inequality. So we have the signal energy on one point giving a bound, which is intuitive. You know, there's once I fix the signal energy, then I'm leaving everything on my choice of filter H of F to try and increase the ratio of the signal to noise power once both the signal and the noise have been affected by the, my choice of filter. So uh, continuing, we now have uh, this form of the uh, Schwartz inequality. And remember I said that we had equality when G1 was pretty much a multiple of G2. And so this is uh, the relationship that we get uh, now uh, that we require for our filter. And basically our filter should be our signal. Of course, there's a complex conjugate, so it's, it's 
it's, we say that it's matched to the signal. So it's not the signal exactly, but it's matched to the signal. And uh, by matching it, this constant doesn't matter. Um, this is uh, complex exponential is, will have an effect uh, I'll talk about. Uh, but basically, we're, best choice is pick whatever you want for the signal and now make your match filter look like this signal. So we have equality in the Schwartz's um, inequality for this relationship. And if we look in the time domain, what this means, so I'm going to take the inverse Fourier transform of this um, complex conjugate of the signal um, spectrum multiplied by this complex exponential. And this complex exponential has the impact of being a time delay. So basically what we're doing is um, flipping our signal in the time domain and putting it into a delay. So um, this is a way of looking at it in the frequency domain and another interpretation in the time domain. So now we know that this filter, what we should be using for the impulse response for this filter, and uh, we know that the uh, optimal threshold in order to maximize the likelihood uh, would be to take the midpoint of the um, uh, two means of the test statistics. We saw that last time. So from this uh, filter, first of all, which S? <laughs> there's two S's. There's S0 and there's S1. So it's great to say I should match it, but I should match it to which, which one of these two possibilities in the binary case. And in, of course, the binary case, there'll be multiple choices. So which one do I use? So do I use S1 of T? Do I use S2 of T? Well, let, let's take each one, one at a time. Imagine that I have my received signal and I split it between two filters and one of them I match to zero and one of them I match to one. So in the end, what I get then are two st test statistics, not one test statistic, but two. And we know that in each one of those branches, I will have optimized the signal to noise ratio when it's the right one. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have two st test statistics and then my strategy is going to be choose the largest because in each branch I will have optimized the signal to noise ratio. And of course, in the um, branch where the signal is present, uh, I will have a better correlation and I'll get a higher match. So this comparison with the threshold becomes choose the largest of the two test statistics which are generated. And in fact, I don't actually have to construct two separate uh, matched filters. I can use one equivalent um, matched filter. And that equivalent is, since I'm going to be choosing the largest, why don't I just form the difference? So if I have the difference between the two, it will, uh, if it's positive, I know that the Z1 was larger, and if it's negative, I know the Z0 was larger. And so what I can do is compare this new statistics, compare it to zero, and this effective filter that I use is just the difference between the two filters. Then the output of this one filter will give me a statistic I can test against a threshold. So I don't need the complexity of two branches in this case. Um, and this is the match filter I should use. It should be matched to the difference between the two uh, symbols. So again, for the maximum likelihood, and, and of course there is some uh, caveat I should say, and that is assuming that the signals have equal power. But under this um, hypothesis, this would be a very simple solution for the match filter. Thank you.